Item number, SCP-408. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. The screen mesh aviary must be kept properly maintained by level two personnel with backgrounds in biology or lepidoptery. Proper humidity must be maintained and recorded once per day and backed up to site 17. 200 feeders filled with an aqueous sugar solution are to be maintained and refilled once per week. Description SCP-408 is a large mass of Lepidoptera, taking the appearance of zebra butterflies when not camouflaged. SCP-408 acts as a single entity at all times, speculated to be a form of hive mind communication amongst the mass. When inactive, SCP-408 will take on the color, pattern, and even texture of its immediate surroundings, making them functionally invisible. When threatened, SCP-408 has been observed to take on the form and appearance of a number of threatening creatures as a defense method, including a pride of lions, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and most notably, SCP-682. SCP-408 possesses the ability to communicate and reason, utilizing its ability to manipulate its color into words and sentences to reply to researchers. IQ tests administered to SCP-408 have evaluated its IQ to be 109, or slightly above average. However, when a part of the swarm is isolated, lower scores have been reported, resulting in a theory that SCP-408 shares its cognitive capacity amongst the entirety of the swarm. As of date expunged, SCP-408 prefers to be identified by its SCP number. SCP-408 was discovered in Expunged, Brazil, after reports that locals and logging teams found their maps to be frequently inaccurate regarding the size of the rainforest. After reports of animal sightings not local to either the Brazilian rainforest and some not found on Earth at all, Foundation agents began an investigation, resulting in the discovery of SCP-408. After learning it was intelligent, Dr. who accompanied the agents in the field, communicated with SCP-408 and convinced it to accompany him to Site-17, where their current habitat exists. Addendum 408-A Regarding SCP-408's knowledge of SCP-682, an investigation is underway regarding this leak of information. Incident 408-A Due to a failure by appropriate personnel to properly refill 408's feeders, the swarm took it upon itself to find sustenance by its own means. Taking the appearance of several level 1 personnel, SCP-408 convinced a passerby to open the door to the aviary, upon which they made an escape into the Site-17 facility. For the whole of the day, Site-17 personnel reported an alarming series of irregular events ranging from color-changing walls to several dozen versions of SCP-529 walking down a hallway. Site-17 was placed on lockdown, and Delta level alert when it appeared that 90% of the containment units had been breached. Dr. Kondraki, head of research for 408, had been out on assignment that day, and it wasn't until his return that the illusion had been revealed, and in short order, SCP-408 was returned to its aviary. Little damage was done except to the faculty break room, which was left without proper sweeteners for the next week. Note: It may be just sugar water, but without it, 408 is prone to mischief, as we clearly saw yesterday. It's fortunate that it doesn't act maliciously, but think about others next time you slack off custodial duties. Think about yourself as well, as I will not tolerate having to use sweet and low in my morning coffee for very long. Dr. Kondraki Addendum 408-B Recent field testing has shown that SCP-408 can act as an effective form of active invisibility when ordered to. SCP-408 was able to conceal five Level 2 personnel and keep them undetected throughout the facility. Tests show the concealment to operate at 99.997% efficiency and can be maintained for up to five hours without need for rest or recuperation. The option of lending SCP-408 to task forces for covert operations is pending approval. Addendum 408-C During Incident 239-B- Clef Kondraki, which SCP-408 was heavily involved in, a number of corpses left by Dr. Clef vanished in the aftermath of the event. Surveillance showed that at certain times, 
The entire swarm of SCP-408 would descend on the body, only to leave no trace of the corpse behind. Subsequent testing shows a proportional increase in IQ, although a lack of cooperation when questioned has shed no light on this development. Interview Log 408C Interviewer Dr. Sagai Interviewee SCP-408 Dr. Sagai is seated within the aviary, while SCP-408 hovers around a large feeding trough filled with sugar water. Dr. Sagai I'll start off with asking how you're recovering. You seem to have lost quite a bit of your mass after the SCP-531-D termination. SCP-408 responds by uniformly creating words one after the other. SCP-408 Kondraki Where? Dr. Sagai I'm his substitute for the interview, as he happens to be busy adjusting to his new promotion. Lots of paperwork, I'm told. A moment goes by. SCP-408 I Fine Recover Good Food Good. Dr. Sagai, how exactly do you replenish your numbers? SCP-408 Compl- Another pause. SCP-408 Icated Don't No Word. Dr. Sagai, was Dr. Kondraki the one who taught you to speak? SCP-408 Yes. Teach a Lot. Dr. Sagai, he taught you, but how do you communicate with him? SCP-408 Don't know word lost in space. Dr. Sagai, you lost the part that knew? SCP-408 Yes, I forget until return. Dr. Sagai, Next question then. What happened with SCP-091 ARC and you during the incident a few months ago? SCP-408 Pretty Smell Familiar Long Time Dr. Sagai You mean you'd smelled it before? SCP-408 Yes Before Long Before People Dr. Sagai, are you saying you predate human existence? No response from SCP-408. Dr. Sagai, never mind, doesn't matter. Last question. Dr. Sagai closes the interview questionnaire and sets it onto the ground. Dr. Sagai, what is the nature of your relationship with Dr. Kondraki? SCP-408, he, think, write. He right. Dr. Sagai, that's not what I meant. Logs show that you're with him, out of containment, almost all of the time now. Dr. Kondraki has been breaching protocol by letting you out of containment. SCP-408, I don't know. What? Dr. Sagai, you're going to admit this to me, so I can bring it before oversight. Do you know what I was doing before that schmuck snatched me up as an assistant? I was head of research for the entire subhuman safe SCP sector. Now, I'm interviewing a damn insect. I will have him thrown out. Oversight won't let him get away with this. SCP-408 proceeds to approximate a laugh, as described in the log as a caricatured face displayed by SCP-408. Dr. Sagai. Are you laughing at me? I'm about to have your little friend terminated, and you're having a chuckle. SCP-408 shifts to display a new image, which was presumed to be a live feed of Dr. Kondraki in his new office. Dr. Sagai. No, that's not possible. I read the damn logs. You can't do that. You can't do that! Dr. Sagai attempts to damage SCP-408. Guards later found Dr. Sagai huddled in a fetal position, displaying symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress syndrome. Item Number SCP-447 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-447-1 is to be kept within a 50-gallon clear plastic container at all times, monitored by camera by a security level 3 or higher staff member to prevent overflow. Area is to be maintained at level 1 clean room status, to prevent contamination by foreign matter at a site at least 10 kilometers from any cemetery, morgue, or mortuary. Under no circumstances is SCP-447 to be allowed to come into contact with dead bodies. Because SCP-447-1 constantly excretes a viscous greenish slime, designated SCP-447-2, at a rate of approximately 10 cc's an hour, a Class D personnel in good physical condition is to be detailed to harvest the excreted slime at least once per day. SCP-447-2 can be harvested using any appropriate equipment, so long as safety procedures are carefully adhered to in order to prevent on-site fatalities. Slime can be transported in an ordinary sealed glass or plastic container through any standard mode of transportation, provided that there is no risk of the slime coming into contact with a dead body en route. Although malodorous, the slime harvested from SCP-447-1 is non-toxic, non-corrosive, and non-radioactive. It is, in fact, perfectly safe, so long as it does not come into contact with a dead body. The slime is edible and reportedly makes a good salad dressing. Adding 10 cc of SCP-447-2 to 1 gallon of gasoline improves fuel efficiency by 150%. Furthermore, SCP-447-2 can be refined into a useful lubricant, approved for use in all SCP Foundation installations, so long as said lubricant is never used to lubricate dead bodies. All staff assigned to SCP-447 are to be screened by polygraph for any suicidal, necrophiliac, or homicidal tendencies. In addition, all staff assigned to SCP-447 must be in good health and good physical condition, and must adhere to on-site safety regulations at all times. This is to minimize the risk of SCP-447, or its generated slime, coming into contact with a dead body. Description SCP-447-1 is a green sphere, approximately 5 centimeters in diameter, with a spongy surface texture and a weight of 1.37 kilograms. The object is warm to the touch, approximately the same temperature as a human body, although its core temperature is slightly higher. Personnel handling SCP-447-1 have reported no adverse effects, so long as SCP-447-1 does not come into contact with a dead body. SCP-447 was retrieved by Foundation agents on in the city of California, United States of America. The incident clearly illustrates the danger inherent in allowing either SCP-447 unit to come into contact with a dead body. The dangers of allowing SCP-447-1 or 2 to come into contact with dead bodies have been clearly documented. Detailed eyewitness reports can be found in Appendix 447-B. Prior Incidents To summarize, however, initial effects include Data expunged per O5 level directive. Research into this field forbidden upon pain of immediate termination or demotion to Class D. Please contact your supervisor for more details. Addendum 447A SCP-447 downgraded from Keter to safe, so long as security measures are in place to prevent SCP-447 from coming into contact with dead bodies. Please see Experiment Log 447A for further potential applications of SCP-447. Experiment Log 447A Experiment Log for SCP-447-2 Approved by O5 Project Head Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged Test Subject SCP-882 Procedure SCP-447-2 was refined into a lubricant. SCP-882 was temporarily removed from its seawater bath, and SCP-447-2 applied as lubricant to all joints and connections. Results Although SCP-447-2 was successful in reducing grinding and noise by 50%, it was also successful in removing rust from the structure. SCP-882 was immediately returned to its seawater bath and staff on hand were placed in quarantine for examination. Notes. Let's not try that again, shall we? Dr. A. Clef. Date. 
Expunged. Test subject. One guinea pig. Purchased from pet shop. Procedure. Subject was immersed in SCP-4472 for five minutes. Care was taken to keep the subject's head above the level of the fluid, to prevent the death of the test subject. Results. Subject's fur became saturated with the fluid. Test item required several hours of grooming to remove SCP-4472 from its fur. No further deleterious effects reported. Notes. After careful washing to remove all traces of SCP-4472 from its fur, subject was subsequently consumed by Agent who is of Peruvian descent. Said agent reported that the meat was, in his own words, the best cuy I've ever had. Approval for testing of SCP-4472 as a marinade is currently on hold, pending review of whether or not a steak constitutes a dead body. Date. Expunged. Test Subject One Tablet SCP-500 Procedure Subject was immersed in SCP-4472 for five minutes. Results In addition to curing all diseases, subject now also leaves the patient's breath feeling minty fresh. Notes About what was expected. Seriously, guys, what were you thinking would happen? Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged Test Subject SCP-76-2 Procedure 500 milliliters of SCP-4472 was added to 500 milliliters distilled vodka and two dozen ice cubes, shaken well, and strained into a pitcher. Approximately 0.2 liters of the mixture were poured into a glass with mint and a lime garnish. Mixture was taken to SCP-76-2, who was told, Hey Abel, try this. It's pretty good. Results. SCP-76-2 agreed that the mixture was, in his words, refreshing, but immediately lost interest when told of SCP-4472's interaction with dead bodies. Notes. Because of SCP-76-2's tendency to become and or create dead bodies, further contact with SCP-447 is forbidden. Date. Expunged. Test Subject One Pentium 4 Computer 1.5 GHz With Data Expunged Procedure Subject was immersed in SCP-4472 for 5 minutes, with the power cord unplugged. Results Subject became caked in goo, and no longer functions. Notes Whoever came up with this one should be kicked in the head. Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged. Test Subject SCP-63 Procedure Dr. used SCP-447 instead of toothpaste to brush his teeth with SCP-63. Results Given that Dr. doesn't need to use toothpaste to begin with, not much, really. Notes What is with you people? Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged Test Subject One Dead Body Notes Test was aborted. The scientist who made the proposal has been reassigned as Class D personnel. Notes 2 Seriously guys, how hard is it to understand? No Dead Bodies None Nada Nine Don't think about it, don't joke about it, and most certainly, don't do it! Sheesh! Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged Test Subject Dr. A. Clef Procedure Dr. A. Clef was ambushed in the hallway, dragged into a room with a bathtub full of SCP-4472, and immersed for approximately 25 seconds. Results Subject became irate and threatened to kill staff members carrying out the experiment, if it were not for the fact that doing so would violate experimental protocol. Notes As soon as this mess is cleaned up, you will all be missed. Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged Test Subject Potassium Nitrate Sugar Mix Procedure a spoonful of SCP-447 was added to the mix of potassium nitrate and sugar, 
in order to make a makeshift smoke grenade. Results. Not only did the new mix slow down the combustion in such a way that the generated smoke was ten times greater and lasted approximately five minutes longer than the original mix, but it also colored the smoke with a green tint and left it with a minty smell. Notes. Not bad for a $3 smoke grenade. Although this wouldn't work so well in the field, the odds of the smoke reaching a dead body are just too high. Date. Expunged. Test subject. Professor Snyder. Procedure. Two drops. One microliter each of SCP-447. One in each of Professor Snyder's eyes. Note that Professor Snyder has an astigmatism and normally wears corrective eyewear. Results. Vision was clear and focused for six hours, though Professor Snyder reported to now see everything in a green tint. Subject's eyesight soon returned to normal, though both eyes are now a much more brilliant green than before. Notes. Oh well. I look better with my glasses anyway. Professor Snyder. Notes 2. This might be marketable as vision correction, but people might notice the extra green. Regardless, I'd like to request a couple of liters of this stuff for personal use. Agent Marr. Date. Expunged. Test subject. 8 ounce, 236 milliliter glass of skim milk. Procedure. 2 teaspoons, 10 milliliters, of SCP-447 thoroughly stirred into milk. Results. Milk turned a bright green in color and was slightly thicker, with a slight minty flavor. Chemical analysis later indicated that the concoction was now lactose-free. Notes. You know, we might be able to market this stuff. I'm pretty sure dead bodies don't drink milk. Professor Snyder. Date. Expunged. Test subject. 15 pounds. 6.8 kilograms. Quick dry cement. Procedure. Cement powder and 5 gallons or 19 liters of SCP-447 rotated inside a standard miniature cement mixer. Results. Mixture took on a green tinge and solidified to a hardness 50% greater than normal concrete, though it took twice as long to dry. Notes. It seems promising, but it's time-consuming to make, and the risks of a dead body falling on a slab of this stuff is too high. Professor Snyder. Date. Expunged. Test subject. Two cups of water. 475 milliliters. Procedure. One tablespoon, 15 milliliters, of SCP-447-2 thoroughly stirred into water. Results. Water turned a green tint, but is otherwise normal. Contaminants reduced by 78%. Notes. This would make a good chlorine substitute for swimming pools. All the cleanliness of chlorinated water without the bleachy smell or hair discoloration. Too bad some swimmers are careless and turn into dead bodies. Dr. Ray A. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One pizza, produced by SCP-458. Procedure. One small sauce cup of SCP-447-2 is held in one hand by Agent Palinuk, while the other holds SCP-458. Results. No outward change in the composition of SCP-447-2 is evident. SCP-458 produced a hamburger pizza on a cheese-stuffed crust. After dipping a slice in SCP-447-2 and ingesting, Agent Palinuk noted the taste of the substance was like a creamy Italian dressing. Following his consumption of the pizza, Agent Palinuk's breath was said to be minty fresh. He then proceeded to hoard the pizza box to himself for a few hours. Notes. Though this brings up new indication into the nature of SCP-458, nothing remarkable has come to attention from this, other than Pal's tendency to overeat. Slight psychological therapy may be in order. Dr. Del Marino. I'd suggest we market this stuff as a dressing, but people eating lots of pizza on a regular basis tend to become dead bodies, so... Agent Palinuk. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One cellular phone. Procedure. Phone is placed in one small plastic container holding one liter of SCP-447-2. 
and left to sit for five minutes with power off and battery disconnected. Results. Phone is ruined and subsequently destroyed in a nearby furnace. The ashes and fumes from the burning phone were reported to be green and minty in scent. Notes. Hey, has anyone seen my phone? Agent Palinuk. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One Trojan condom. Procedure. Dr. A placed the condom on his data expunged and applied SCP-4472 onto it. He then tested the SCP-4472 covered condom by data expunged. Results. Data expunged. Dr. A reports that the procedure, quote, went really well. Notes. I could market this as that kind of lubricant, but I don't think a warning label is enough to ensure that some necrophiliac doesn't use it on a dead body. Dr. A. Date. Expunged. Test subject. Three cars. One 2006 Honda Civic. 106 Dodge Stratus. 106 Chevy Malibu. Procedure. SCP-447 was used as liquids in each vehicle, mixed equally with oil, used as window washer fluid, and mixed into the radiator. Results. Each car had each liquid added individually. The various components of each engine performed with superb results. The Honda's radiator did not overheat until temperatures reached in excess of 340 degrees Celsius, more than twice the average temperature of a vehicle. The water seemed to be tinted green, even after being drained. The Stratus's windshield was cleaned to factory new perfection, and resisted dirt and grime after use. Side effect described as green tinted glass. The Malibu's engine components were lubricated to perfection and lasted over 160,000 miles on a dynamometer. Exhaust was tinted green. Notes. Impressive, but given the intelligence of some drivers, the chance of dead bodies contaminating the sample is too high. Dr. Axe. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One roll of duct tape. Procedure. SCP-447 was applied to the adhesive side of a strip of duct tape, which was subsequently attached to a cement brick. Results. Tape had bonded to the cement with twice the strength expected of a normal strip. Cement brick was left with a green stain in the shape of the strip of tape. Notes. This could be marketable, but with all the possible uses for duct tape comes the even greater risk of coming into contact with dead bodies. Dr. Slav. Date. Expunged. Test subject. Nuclear reactor at site. Procedure. During the regular maintenance. Leaders of SCP-4472 were added to the moderator material in the reactor. Results. The moderation of neutrons was increased by. Leading to very high thermal output. And temperature alarms being activated. The reactor's chamber gained a green tinge. And faint mint smell. Notes. Effective, but the chance of an explosion and radioactive slime reaching dead bodies over a large area is too high. Dr. Kotska. Notes 2. Dr. Kotska has been incarcerated and sent to a corrective facility for unauthorized and extremely dangerous testing. 05. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One Colt Python revolver with an 8-inch barrel. Procedure. Gun was taken apart for regular cleaning. The cleaning cloth was put in a small tub of SCP-4472 and soaked for five minutes. Cleaned as normally would. Lubrication replaced with SCP-4472. Results. Gun fired with a 35% reduction in recoil. Testing found bullets fired had their maximum speed increased by nearly 210% and acceleration increased by 55%. Accuracy was increased by 3.7% at close range, and by 486% at maximum range. Max range was also increased by 40%. Gun smoke was green in tint. Interestingly, unspent ammunition put into the gun were stated to smell minty and had a green tint. Despite this, when these bullets were removed and fired from another gun, 
said Gunn did not receive any benefits. Notes. The more testing we do, the more I begin to wonder how more advanced technology would be. If only this damned dead body curse didn't exist. This stuff would benefit us in so many ways. This test shows that guns would become extremely efficient. But then again, guns are used to kill people, so you will run into a dead guy at some point. Notes 2. I suppose we could use this in a combat situation, but only as a last resort. And even then, we'd have to be careful. Dr. Clinton. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One liter of candle wax. Procedure. Wax was added to SCP-447-2 in a 2 to 1 ratio of wax to SCP-447-2. A candle wick was dipped into the wax to create a candle. Results. The candle gave off 50% more light at a distance of 10 meters, and also gave off a strong smell of mint as it burned. However, the candle burnt out in roughly half the time of a candle made solely out of wax, and was far more difficult to extinguish, requiring a CO2 fire extinguisher to put out. Notes. While it may seem like a good idea to market it, the mint smell was far too strong to the point of being nauseating. The candle also burns out too quickly to be used as a source of light as well. I suppose you could use it as an air freshener, but seeing how dangerous fire can be and how hard it is to put out, well, let's just say there's a good chance of it coming into contact with a dead body somewhere down the line. Date. Expunged. Test Subject. SCP-586. Procedure. 10 milliliters of SCP-447-2 was directly applied to SCP-586. Results. No noticeable cha-chas to structure, composition, or effect of SCP-586 were noted. However, SCP-586 became more violently luminescent in its shade of gray, and was reported afterwards to smell strongly of mint. Notes. I see no point in continuing this line of zesting, but it is safe. Very little chance of dank bodies here. Dr. Date. Expunged. Test Subject. SCP-914. Procedure. One liter of SCP-447-2 in a cylindrical glass container was placed in SCP-914 and refined on the rough setting. Results. Ten cylindrical glass containers all exactly one-tenth the mass of the original container, each holding 100 milliliters of SCP-447-2. Notes. Well, what did you expect? Dr. Date. Expunged. Test Subject. SCP-914. Procedure. One liter of SCP-447-2 in a cylindrical glass container was placed in SCP-914 and refined on the course setting. Results. One liter of SCP-447-2 in a cylindrical glass container. All SCP-447-2 recovered in this manner gradually degraded to an unknown fluid, with similar composition to Terciops truncatus with a half-life of two hours. Notes. After most of it is sufficiently degraded, I suggest this new fluid be run through similar tests as were conducted before. Dr. Notes 2. Agent R, head cook at site, reports that this new fluid has a simple and rustic, yet surprisingly compelling flavor, and has requested 5 liters for culinary use. Request denied. Date. Expunged. Test subject. SCP-914. Procedure. One liter of SCP-447-2 in a cylindrical glass container was placed in SCP-914 and refined on the one-to-one -one setting. Results. A dead body. Notes. Further cross-testing of SCP-447-2 with SCP-914 has been enjoined by order of 05 Date. Expunged. Test subject. Two liters of brand paint primer. Procedure. 250 milliliters of SCP-447-2 was mixed thoroughly into the paint primer. Results. The primer took on a green hue and started to smell minty. The resulting paint was approximately 200% more opaque when compared to a different can of primer. Notes. 
This would be marketed in home improvement stores. But the chances of a dead body coming into contact with painted surfaces is too high. Plus, the smell of mint is overpowering when a whole room is painted with the primer. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One pair of Adidas brand running shoes. Size 12. Procedure. 10 liters of SCP-4472 was poured into a standard hardware store bucket. The pair of Adidas shoes were submerged in SCP-4472 for 5 minutes and removed. Shoes were then applied to researcher Ortiz's feet. Results. Rubber and sole increased by 37% in density, allowing subject to run slightly faster. Shoelaces became 13% more rigid, slightly decreasing the chance of the knot coming unraveled. Shoes emitted a minty scent. Notes. We could market this as some kind of shoe conditioner, but I seem to be aware of the fact that many dead bodies wear shoes. Researcher Ortiz. Date. Expunged. Test subject. A variety of clothing belonging to Dr. Levy. Procedure. 100 milliliters of SCP-4472 was used as a substitute for fabric conditioner in a washing machine. Dr. Levy's clothes were washed for 30 minutes, after which the clothes were dried and worn by Dr. Levy. Results. The clothing seemed more resistant to rips and tears, as well as shrinking. Dr. Levy reported that the clothes felt more comfortable than before. Clothes took on a slight green tinge, as well possessing a slightly minty smell. Notes. We could market this as a fabric conditioner, though some people might not like the green tinge and the smell. Plus, there's the problem that dead bodies are often clothed. Dr. Levy. Date. Expunged. Test subject. Dr. Hakila's hand. Procedure. A drop of SCP-4472 was placed on the back of the subject's hand via an eyedropper. Results. Dr. Hakila proceeded to slap a nearby researcher across the face. The researcher said that they had a minty taste in their mouth after being slapped. Dr. Hakila proceeded to do the same to someone else, but the effect had worn off. Notes. First of all, why? Second of all, why did we let him do it? Dr. A. Clef. Date. Expunged. Test subject. A ballpoint pen. Procedure. The ink cartridge was infused with 0.5 milliliters of SCP-4472. Results. Anything written with the pen became approximately 27% clearer and gained a greenish tint. A slight minty smell also started emanating from the ink. Notes. This could be great to market to children. Scented pens. And I don't think there's much of a likelihood of it coming into contact with dead bodies. Although you can never be too safe. Dr. Aherna. Date. Expunged. Test subject. 111045T5 wire stripper. Procedure. Metal portion of subject was submerged in SCP-4472 for 30 seconds and used to strip 12 AWG copper NMS cable. Results. Any insulation was easily peeled off regardless of improper use of the tool but stuck to the T5s and had to be removed by hand. Notes. This would make the lives of new electricians so much easier. Unfortunately, they could be careless and get shocked to death while holding on to this. Dr. A. Clef. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One standard sized tub of Legos. Procedure. Tub was filled and submerged in SCP-4472 for one minute and used to create a variety of items. Results. Builders state that the directions just kind of come to us. We don't even need to look at the manual. Bricks also turned lime green and have a faint mint smell. Notes. The only reason I say we shouldn't market this is the fact that a small child could choke on it. Then we have an entire new thing to deal with. Dr. Markman. Formally requesting this tub for recreational use. They're really addicting. Dr. Sanders. Accepted. Have fun. Dr. Markman. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One of each Foundation Security keycard tier leading up to four. Procedure. 
key cards were left to dip in SCP-4472 for one hour, then tested on pre-made keycard testing doors. Results All keycards had their numbers erased and replaced with the level 2 tiers above their own. All cards performed with their respective new numbers. Notes Requesting an extra level 4 keycard and one liter of SCP-4472. Dr. Sanders <laughs> No. Dr. Markman Date Expunged Test Subject 2 AA Batteries Procedure Batteries were submerged in SCP-4472 for 30 minutes, then inserted into Dr. Clinton's flashlight, which was then shown until batteries were out of power. Results Both batteries lasted roughly 28% longer than usual and were tinted a light green. The light from the flashlight was also a light green. Notes Alright, this we can probably use. Pretty sure dead bodies can't use batteries. But, uh, someone may want to make sure that the green light doesn't have the same properties as the normal slime. Dr. Clinton Nope, batteries have a tendency to cause dead bodies when around babies. Dr. Engelhart Date Expunged Test Subject 10 M202A1 Flash Rockets Procedure Rockets were coated in SCP-4472 for 50 minutes, loaded into an M202A1 flash to test explosion size, flame duration, and accuracy. Results The explosion size remained the same. The flame's post-detonation lasted 10% longer, along with having a greenish tint. No temperature difference noted. No difference in accuracy. Notes Well, the accuracy of it isn't improved because it's not the rocket launcher itself. It's the rockets. Weapons researcher person. Weapons researcher person, it is requested that you not do this again. Weapons have a way of creating dead bodies. Actually, wait a moment. How did you even get in? With a weapon? Senior researcher... I have my ways. Weapons researcher person. Date. Expunged. Test subject. One urn. Procedure. Urn was polished on the inside and outside with a mix of polish and SCP-4472 at a 3 to 1 ratio. Results. Experiment was interrupted just as ashes from a dead body were about to be put in. Notes. Ashes from dead bodies are dead bodies too! I don't care how curious you are, but no ashes from dead bodies! Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged Test Subject SCP-999 Procedure SCP-999 was submerged in SCP-4472 for two minutes. Results SCP-999 exhibited a green tint for five hours and in addition to curing depression, gave the subject green eyes. Notes Hmm, SCP-999 looked pretty cool, and we may be able to do this again. We could even reconsider marketing it as an antidepressant. Dr. Fall No. Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged Test Subject One Katana Procedure the katana was submerged in SCP-4472 for five minutes. Results The katana emerged with a distinct green tinge to the blade. Dr. Clef confiscated the katana before any tests could be conducted on its performance. Notes Are you maniacs trying to give me a nervous breakdown? The whole point of a sword is to kill people! Dr. A. Clef Date Expunged. Test Subject. One vial of SCP-4472. Aged 30 days. Procedure. The vial was submerged in SCP-4472 for five minutes. After that period of time, the vial was removed. The contents poured onto the top of the SCP-4472 solution for five minutes. Results. Vial was tightly sealed. It's simultaneously easy to remove. The solution within the vial turned a bright green, 
and gave off an extremely minty odor, now designated SCP-4473. Notes. I really thought this was going to go nowhere. Maybe you slack-jawed yokels have some sort of a brain in that FedEx box of a head. Have the solution of 4473 sent to my office. I would like to personally conduct an experiment with it. Dr. A. Clef. Date. Expunged. Test subject. Two $1 bills. USD. Procedure. One bill was submerged in a cup of SCP-4472 for five minutes. The other submerged for the same amount of time within a cup of SCP-4473, referenced above. Results. The bill submerged in SCP-4472 became a US $100 bill. The bill submerged with an SCP-4473 became a US $2,500 bill, which, according to the US Hall of Records, never existed, yet is completely usable in a marketplace environment. The bill was removed from circulation shortly after by an MTF team, by command of Dr. A. Clef. Notes. Why would you send that into circulation? Who knows what could happen to that bill out there? Dr. A. Clef. Ooh, I wonder what we can do with this 4473 stuff. Maybe we could make better and better liquid. Like Inception. Dr. Bright. Request denied. We're playing with forces we don't understand here, Jack. Dr. A. Clef. Dr. Bright. Date. Expunged. Test subject. A copy of The Phantom Toll Booth. Procedure. Book was immersed in SCP-4472 for 20 seconds. Results. Book became green and gained a minty smell. Notes. I realized a bit too late that paper might constitute as the dead body of a tree. We really dodged a bullet on that one. Still, let's not try to push the envelope any further. Dr. Norms. Item number. SCP-489. Object Class. Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-489 is held in a containment unit at Site-113. To prevent personnel accidentally bringing insect life into SCP-489's cell, a shower room has been established outside of the containment cell. Personnel will change into the clothes provided to them after cleaning. Testing with SCP-489 is limited to indoor spaces. Due to the potential of containment breach and site damage, at no point may insectile-based anomalies, including instances of SCP-831, be stored at Site-113. Description SCP-489 is a roughly dome-shaped conglomerate mass, consisting entirely of objects used to kill or repel insects, e.g. aerosol pesticide cans, bug zappers, fly swatters, footwear, and lighters. Each item is capable of independent autonomous movement, though they usually move along the ground as a whole when in motion. As of June 17, 2013, SCP-489 measures roughly 5 meters in height and 8 meters in diameter at the base. There is a badly damaged transit van in the center of the mass, which contains a human skeleton sitting in the driver's seat. The skeleton's ribcage has been crushed. A faded, scratched logo can be seen on the right side of the van, which reads, Extreme Extermination Sick Services Will Bash Any Bug, Big or Small 1555 Bug Bash When an insect of any species comes within 5 meters of SCP-489, SCP-489 will surge towards the animal and attempt to kill it. Of note is that SCP-489 is heedless of other non-insect organisms, should an insect be on or nearby them when attacking, usually resulting in severe injury or death should said organisms fail to move in time. However, Due to the number of objects moving at once, SCP-489 often fails to reach the target at all, instead having individual parts impede one another's movement. If SCP-489 fails to kill the insects, individual items on SCP-489 become hostile to one another and begin hitting objects adjacent to them. When not in the presence of an insect, 
SCP-489 is relatively docile, making study of it easier. Should SCP-489 successfully terminate an insect, objects capable of handling it safely, e.g. tweezers, shovels, etc., will retrieve and pass the insect along the edge of SCP-489, towards the storage space of SCP-489. During this time, it becomes possible to see the transit van without imaging due to items moving out of the way to open the doors. The storage space of the van in SCP-489 possesses extra-dimensional properties, containing dozens of rows of glass jars stored on wooden shelves. Every jar is full of various dead insects. If presented with new objects that would be considered bug killers, SCP-489 will readily attempt to incorporate them into itself. However, this habit makes its goal of exterminating insects even more difficult with the newly acquired mass. Newly added items immediately show signs of sentience. When new items are introduced to SCP-489, other items will enter the van's storage space and bring numerous jars containing disproportionately large specimens to the front of the storage space. These samples appear to serve as trophies for SCP-489. Each jar is labeled with a date and how the insect was obtained. Newly added items will gather around these jars in apparent admiration. Here is a list of several specimens SCP-489 has presented. Description: Three beetle-like creatures each measuring 1.5 meters in length. The abdomens are covered in large, thorn-like protrusions. The Savage Spine-Shooting Beetles Obtained July 7, 1989 The beasts were terrorizing the village of Lathos in Thoazola, brought down with the help of Julie and her garden gang. Description A thin, knobby, elongated creature resembling a stick insect, with an additional six pairs of legs. Each leg measures roughly 2.5 meters. Body length is roughly 5 meters. The Walking Lance Obtained December 20th, 1984 Found roaming the jagged rocky mountains of Jerinth. Its bladed legs felled Karen and Matthew before a well-aimed shot from Maxwell skewered its head. Description A horseshoe crab-like creature with prominent mandibles, paddle-like legs, and several sack-like growths lining its back and underbelly. Length roughly 2 meters. The Aquatic Venomous Floater Bug Obtained March 26th, 1987 A new challenge. One that took place beneath the waters of the Burmese Swamplands. We have the scars to show for it, but the beast fell after the puncturing of its venom sacs. Description A humanoid entity 1.8 meters in height, with eyes and proboscis resembling a housefly. Musca Domestica. The Bug Man. Obtained May 5th, 1991. Found within the frozen hills of Russia. Well worth the battle and losses. Theo and the Torch's sacrifice will be honored by all bug killers for eternity. Description. An arthropod with four thick short legs, all spreading from its abdomen in a circle. Creature has large elongated pincers and a head featuring a prominent proboscis and compound eyes. Height, roughly 4 meters. The Bug That Killed Master Obtained November 18th, 2000 Master fought hard, but he had finally met a bug he couldn't kill. We fought for him and made it suffer, but we couldn't save our leader. Description A wooden case with several pinned, non-anomalous butterflies, beetles, and dried earthworms. Our first kills after Master's death, obtained from February to April of 2001. We will carry on Master's work. Item Number SCP-550 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-550 is to be held in a standard-sized humanoid cell. SCP-550 should be provided with a human corpse on a bi-weekly basis. Any remaining materials are to be cleaned and removed from the containment chamber after provision. All personnel handling SCP-550 are to wear provided chemical-resistant gloves and hazmat suits at all times.
Directions made toward SCP-550 may be broadcast from speakers installed in its containment chamber and should be used for transportation, maintenance, and testing. Description SCP-550 is a humanoid composed of wood shavings from Fraxinus excelsior, European ash, measuring 2.1 meters in height and 70 kilograms in weight. SCP-550 closely resembles a human male suffering from advanced muscle atrophy, though it lacks all exterior and bodily organs. SCP-550 is mainly compliant to human subjects, though it is restricted to following simple commands. Conversation through alternative systems of communication has been unsuccessful in determining if SCP-550 is sapient. SCP-550 is able to smell despite the lack of any sensory organs, and does this solely for the purpose of locating human corpses. SCP-550 is mainly drawn toward corpses in early stages of putrefaction. If no such cadaver is in the vicinity, it will attempt to locate one itself through bipedal locomotion. Upon finding a cadaver, SCP-550 will unravel itself to create a wide split in the area where a chest would be and will kneel over the cadaver and make physical contact with the cavity. This cavity does not appear to be different from SCP-550's exterior, and it secretes high concentrations of hydrochloric acid. The acid produced by SCP-550 does not dissolve the wood it is covered in. SCP-550 is capable of incorporating simple molecules and compounds through its cavity. The hydrochloric acid it produces is used in breaking down organic substances located in corpses, allowing it to take nutrients through pores in the wood it is composed of. SCP-550 mainly intakes amino acids and various proteins, though it is unclear in how it uses them to maintain itself. SCP-550 will continue making contact with its chosen corpse, before closing its chest cavity and standing up. SCP-550 will then release a slurry of materials, mostly containing loose portions of epidermis, articles of clothing, if present on the corpse, and stomach bile. When deprived of corpses for several days, SCP-550 will enter a dormant state and refrain from movement for an indefinite period of time until a corpse is available. Addendum 550 Recovery SCP-550 was found at the site of a mass grave in South Africa. Foundation intelligence was made aware of rumors being passed between locals regarding a ghoul, descriptions of which had been marked deviations from traditional folklore. MTF Beta-7, Maz Hatters, was dispatched with orders to confirm the existence of a potential Euclid-class being, and to retrieve it on the Foundation's behalf. 28 corpses were found to have been damaged by SCP-550, and Protocol Sown Veil was enacted to restore bodies to acceptable conditions. Several ritualistic items, such as incense, candles, pieces of a large cloth stained with various bodily fluids, utensils, pots, plates, and various salts and spices were found scattered throughout the graveyard. One person was reported missing in the town of SCP-550's original location, a local resident named Sianda. No corpse has been found that matches the civilian. Other town members claim had begun taking regular trips to a neighboring town prior to their disappearance. On search of the civilian's home, a voicemail from a public phone located in was found. No other evidence of possible involvement with SCP-550 was discovered. Forward. The following is translated from the Bantu language, belonging to the Zulus. Coughing and heavy breathing, masculine voice. We know you feel it in you. I know you do not want to answer me. You need to come. We are here to open those shredded bonds, never mind their state. You're famished, yet you are not hungry. Where do you expect to hide from what you need? A feminine voice can be heard whispering for four seconds before the caller makes a sound of approval. Ketiwia says she is prepared, so now it is only up to you. Do you not want to let it burn through your bones, mixing you into the slime from where we began? Do you not want to become one with the saliva of the beast, soaking in the juices of your kin? You know what to do. 
We want to bring ourselves inside the beast. This is not something you should be afraid of. Further unknown background noises are heard. See, Slindil has already brought forth her tendons. Fresh. Just look at her pinch the eye out. Lord, I can't wait to feel what it is like inside him. Addendum 550A1 419 2011 Analysis of SCP-550 skin samples shows the presence of mucosal cells and microvilli and confirms skin pigmentation as melanin. Dr. has suggested and authorized an MRI scan without sedation. Scan postponed following incident SCP-550-T1. Incident 550-T1 At 3.43 a.m., date expunged. Surveillance showed that SCP-550 had begun pacing in its cell during research of its dormant state. Agent M and Dr. were given permission to investigate. Surveillance footage shows that standard foundation procedure was followed and no abnormalities were found until personnel left. SCP-550 immediately lay down in its cell until a large black tongue, anatomically human, erupted from within SCP-550. Site-36 was placed under lockdown, while the tongue protruding from SCP-550 had begun slathering the entirety of its containment cell. Two minutes and fourteen seconds had passed before the tongue withdrew into SCP-550. An amount of black viscous saliva containing various amounts of organic material from all previously consumed corpses was left on containment chamber walls along with what appeared to be an intact traditional black Zulu dress. Note: Thorough analysis of this material revealed significant teeters of a heavily modified variant strain of SCP-742. Additional analysis of genetic material, including the accompanying viral particles, showed significant splicing and incorporation of functional genes from a variety of plants and several scavenger species aligning with genetic analysis of recovered samples of SCP-3140. Shortly after Incident 550-T1, the tongue belonging to SCP-550 has been recorded to randomly protrude from SCP-550's chest cavity for several seconds. SCP-550 has resorted to remaining in a fetal position, presumably to prevent an event similar to the recent incident. No further deviations in behavior have been noted. Containment procedures are currently being updated. Item Number SCP-554 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures A 100-meter exclusion zone should be maintained around SCP-554 with signage indicating danger of death due to electrocution. A rotating team of three field personnel is to be assigned the task of preventing public exposure to the object. The individual currently designated SCP-554-2 is to be held in Foundation custody at Sector 25. In the event of members of the public or Foundation personnel becoming exposed to the effects of SCP-554, the following procedures apply. 174 Macadamia where an individual has viewed SCP-554-1. Communication with Sector 25 should be established immediately to confirm that the individual previously designated SCP-554-2 has undergone a 554 Boojum event. Exposed individual is to be designated SCP-554-2 and conveyed to Sector 25. Containment is to be re-established and any eyewitnesses administered amnestics. 889 Almond, where multiple individuals have viewed SCP-554-1 in a short time span. Surviving individual is to be interrogated to establish the identity, where possible, of others exposed. Failing this, it will become necessary to remove SCP-554-1 and identify the corpse. Precautions must be taken to avoid accidental exposure while retrieving SCP-554-1. Corpses removed from SCP-554 are to be conveyed to Sector 25. 333. Hickory, where Foundation agents have been exposed to SCP-554-1 in the course of their duties. 
safety of uncontaminated personnel is the highest priority. Where the previously exposed individual has not been identified, the exposed agent has sole responsibility for identifying SCP-554-1. Contaminated personnel are to be designated SCP-554-2 and conveyed to the Sector 25 facility. They should be kept under 24-hour surveillance by at least two staff members to delay a 554 Boozham event. Next of kin should be informed that SCP-554-2 has been diagnosed with a terminal medical condition, video link, or an extremis. Personal contact with SCP-554-2 is authorized at the discretion of sector management. Suitable steps should be taken to safeguard the secrecy of Sector 25. 451 Kachachin Where images or footage of SCP-554-1 has become public knowledge and has proven effective at transmitting the SCP-554 effect. SCP-554 is to be reclassified Keter with immediate effect. High explosives to be used to destroy SCP-554. If neutralization efforts prove ineffective, following protocols are to be implemented, in order provided below, until containment is re-established. White House Protocol Electronic communications to be disabled worldwide to prevent transmission of SCP-554 effect. State approval is to be sought wherever possible. Otherwise, Foundation assets are to be directed to sabotage relevant infrastructure. Amelie's Protocol Use of Project LETHE authorized. Contaminated objects, individuals, and electronic infrastructure are to be destroyed. Wyndham Protocol Orbital assets to be used to neutralize human optic nerves in area of contamination to prevent further transmission. Description SCP-554 is a structure located on Culver Down, Isle of Wight, England. Its state of construction and original purpose are unclear, but photographs taken from the nearby Holiday Park date its presence to the late 1970s. The structure's exterior is comprised of partially oxidized iron plates and concrete. Radiography suggests its interior to consist of a large number of complex mechanical components. A rusted iron ladder permits access to the structure's roof, though as far as can be determined, there is no instrumentation or access to the interior anywhere on SCP-554's exterior. A human corpse, designated SCP-554-1, wrapped in a black plastic refuse bag, is visible in the space between the concrete beams on which SCP-554 is supported. When SCP-554-1 is viewed by a human subject, designated SCP-554-2, the previous individual to view SCP-554-1 will disappear the next time they are out of sight of any observer. This event is designated 554 Boozham. Mechanical observation appears insufficient to prevent this effect. They will disappear between frames, unless a sentient observer maintains unbroken line of sight to a live visual output of the subject. If SCP-554-1 is removed from SCP-554 and identified, it will be discovered to be the corpse of the previous SCP-554-2. The cause of death is invariably multiple stab wounds to the chest and abdomen and the corpse exhibits a level of decomposition consistent with remaining undiscovered for approximately 72 hours. Individuals who undergo 554 Boozham are erased from all written and electronic records within approximately 120 kilometers. This has led to significant difficulty identifying victims of SCP-554. It is not presently believed that human memory is subject to this effect, though this cannot be ruled out. It can be established only that in some cases, memories of the affected individual are not erased, as the Foundation has re-recorded the identities of numerous individuals who have been subject to 554 Boozham. When SCP-554-1 is viewed by a human subject, activity from within SCP-554 has been detected, including mechanical noise and vibration. Markedly increased activity from SCP-554 has been noted in the case of individuals about whom a significant amount of information might be expected to be stored externally. If SCP-554-1 is removed from SCP-554, the next time the space beneath SCP-554 is out of line of sight of any observer, 
A new instance of SCP-554-1 will be generated. Only instances that have not yet been moved appear to spread the SCP-554 effect. Approximately 10% of all images of SCP-554-1 in situ cause the effect when viewed. Contaminated images and all footage of SCP-554-1 are to be destroyed as a matter of course. Addendum SCP-554-1 SCP-554 has been known to the Foundation since 1981 at the latest. Due to the secondary effects of SCP-554, the recovery log initially attached to this document was lost in its entirety at some point prior to 05-07-2005 when the loss was successfully documented. Attempts to reconstruct the circumstances by which the Foundation became aware of SCP-554 via interviewing staff involved with the object at the time are ongoing. The reconstructed recovery log appears below. Note that to safeguard further information pertaining to SCP-554, the primary hard copy of this file is stored at Site-33, with a further copy at Site-60. Reconstructed Recovery Log 554 Agent M, now retired, testifies that SCP-554 was brought to the Foundation's attention in early 1979 as part of an investigation into a Jonathan, John, or Jeremy, who confessed to a number of murders taking place in the 1970s on the Isle of Wight and the south coast of England. He told police that he had hidden the bodies below an old septic tank on the Culver Downs. On arrival, police discovered a single body, which was removed and found to be that of himself, who had apparently escaped from police custody with the destruction of all paperwork relevant to his case. Embedded Foundation assets were activated when the officer who had made the initial discovery was subsequently found murdered in the same location, preceding a string of disappearances. Professor a field agent at the time, recalls several Foundation personnel were lost before SCP-554's properties were established and believes the identities of these individuals were re-documented in a separate file. Note. Dr. testifies that several police officers were committed to a mental institution in southern England to prevent further investigation of SCP-554. Unfortunately, he has been unable to recall the names of these officers or the institution in question. Inquiries into police officers who may have been committed in the early 1980s are ongoing. The file of Foundation personnel subject to 554 Boojum currently dates back no further the 1981. Item Number SCP-555 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-555 is to be placed in a standard containment locker. Corpses are not to be brought within 18 meters of SCP-555 or the room in which it is contained. Note. SCP-555's containment procedures were revised after Incident 555-1. SCP-555 is to be housed in a 5 x 5 by 3 meter concrete containment chamber. Inside the walls, an electromagnetic array with a combined internal field strength of 3 teslas or greater is installed. In an interstitial chamber, a set of the most powerful permanent magnet arrays available is to be held away from the electromagnetic array and moved into place by automatic systems in the event of power failure. The chamber is to be separated from the rest of the facility by an exclusion zone of at least 20 meters, due to dangers posed by high magnetic fields and by the SCP itself. No corpses are ever to be brought into the exclusion zone. A HEPA air filtering system is to be installed to avoid fouling of the SCP. SCP-555 is never to be stored in the same site as SCP-447. Description SCP-555 is a metal cylinder with rounded ends, 1.25 centimeters in diameter and 8 centimeters long, similar to a magnet commonly fed to cattle to prevent hardware disease. It emits a field of unknown nature, which exerts an attractive force on dead or necrotic human tissue, including hair separated from the body, corpses, shed skin cells, and 
In extreme cases, the epidermal layer of the skin. This field does not tend to follow the inverse square law and does not interact with matter or electromagnetic fields in a manner consistent with any known force. The SCP itself appears to be impervious to force, showing no response to focused heating, compression, or striking. The attractive force exerted by the field increases linearly with the amount of dead material in close proximity to the SCP. Past a certain point, measured at approximately 295 kilograms of necrotic material within 2 meters of the SCP, the progression becomes exponential and the field's strength and radius increase rapidly. The field also appears to have an effect on permanent magnets. The field's strength of magnets in proximity to SCP-555 decreases over time, with the rate of decrease changing in proportion to SCP-555's field strength. SCP-555 was recovered by agents in 19 in a cemetery in California. The Foundation was alerted to a possible SCP after a coffin due to be buried was pulled from the pallbearer's grip and came to rest above the grave of a who died in 1948. Its body was turned over to the Foundation forensic specialists who noted that the torso appeared to have been smashed inward, though with no skin damage. The SCP was found inside the corpse's stomach. The corpse was found to have no other anomalous properties and was reinterred. A ground-penetrating radar survey of the cemetery showed that all coffins in a 12-meter radius had been displaced underground towards the site containing the SCP. Addendum Incident Log 555-1 SCP Involved SCP-555 SCP Personnel Involved Data Expunged Doctor Date Expunged Location Expunged Description On A containment breach of SCP caused a security guard to shelter in place in the room containing SCP-555's containment locker, along with two Class D personnel and Dr. One Class D attempted to wrest the guard's firearm from its holster, while the other attempted to strike Dr. The guard shot the first Class D, and the corpse adhered to the outside of the cabinet. The guard then shot the Class D attacking Dr. and his corpse collided with the guard, causing his firearm to discharge. The shot ricocheted off the wall and struck Dr. in the head, killing him. The security guard was subsequently crushed by Dr. Rick's corpse against the locker containing the SCP, collapsing it and killing him. The SCP's field entered geometric progression and pulled the corpses of a number of personnel killed by SCP through the reinforced concrete walls. Eventually, SCP was contained and the situation with SCP-555 was evaluated. Researchers were unable to determine the exact number of corpses stuck to SCP-555, but 17 personnel, including those in the room with SCP-555, were reported missing after containment had been re-established for SCP. The dead matter had formed an approximate sphere of human tissue around the SCP. A Class D personnel trapped in the hallway at the time of the containment breach had had his legs crushed by SCP and was partially entombed in the sphere. Efforts to free him proved fruitless, and because the field strength of SCP-555 would increase by a massive amount if the Class D died in proximity to the SCP, sufficient to envelop the entire facility, including the morgue, the Foundation was forced to undertake heroic measures to keep him alive. Clotting agents and mechanical ventilation were administered, no opiate painkillers or anesthetics were administered due to the chance of causing the death of the Class D. Ibuprofen, aspirin, and acetaminophen were administered after confirming the Class D's lack of allergies to these, to marginal effect. Muscle paralytic was injected intramuscularly in small doses, and restraints were installed after 35 hours, when the Class D attempted to commit suicide by slamming his head against the surrounding material and by attempting to strangle himself. The SCP was moved into a nearby testing chamber, with measures taken to remove any corpse within its affected radius. 
At this point, a tracheotomy was performed on the Class D, as his screaming was determined to be affecting measurements, and a gag would pose danger of him choking. X-ray tomography indicated that the density of the material adhering to the SCP increased in density with proximity, approaching the density of iron within three inches of the surface of the SCP. The material closest to the SCP was determined to be extremely hot. It would be significantly past its boiling point had the material not been under pressure. Predicted response curves showed that should any significant amount of dead matter be added, the field would extend to the site's morgue. Researchers in proximity to the SCP noted symptoms in themselves commensurate with having a constant mechanical force pulling on their epidermis, and were rotated every three hours to prevent burn-like symptoms. In addition, a small but measurable force on living subjects was detected. Experiments showed that the force increased linearly, as small amounts of dead material were added. A decision was made to remove the dead material as soon as possible. Eventually, it was determined that exposure of the matter to a significantly caustic substance, sufficient to render the material into component simple compounds, would cause it to cease to be attracted by the SCP's field, with a commensurate decrease in field strength and density. Researchers then experimented with small portions of dead human tissue and eventually discovered that magnetic fields of extremely high power would damp the field of the SCP. The SCP was slowly lowered into a high-temperature solution of sodium hydroxide, with the Class D facing upwards to avoid premature death. A heating system was installed once it was determined that the decompression of the by now cooled compressed corpses was causing the solution to freeze. After several hours, the Class D and dead material surrounding the SCP were completely dissolved. SCP-555 was recovered intact, completely unaffected by the compression, heat, or caustic soda. Knowledge gained during these containment efforts led to the creation of SCP-555's current containment procedures. Item Number SCP-563 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures as all carcasses of SCP-563-A have been removed from SCP-563, minimal containment of SCP-563 is required. It is to be surrounded by a perimeter of motion trackers at every 3 meters, which are remotely monitored by Site-1265-A, 15 kilometers away. Mobile Task Force Xi-22, codename Hannah's Barbarians is tasked with locating and containing other instances of SCP-563 and finding information pertaining to the Ancient Dragon Culinary Corporation. Currently, MTF Xi-22 is working with the governments of South Korea, Japan, and the People's Republic of China to covertly outlaw the trade of SCP-563-B instances and recall any existing instances, citing food safety concerns. The government of the People's Republic of China is currently collaborating with the Foundation to find sites similar to SCP-563 and locating living instances of SCP-563-A for study. Description SCP-563 is the designation for an abandoned plot of farmland located in Hubei Province, China. The facilities of SCP-563 have been modified for the factory farming of animals weighing up to several tons. SCP-563 is equipped mainly to handle large poultry, but other animals were raised at the facility. SCP-563-A refers to the carcasses of the presumed livestock of SCP-563, which were found at time of recovery. SCP-563-A instances were several species of dinosaur and related reptiles that lived in China and Mongolia in the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. For a partial list of recovered specimens, see Log 563-5. When alive, SCP-563-A instances were presumably farmed to create instances of SCP-563-B. SCP-563-B is the prehistoric food line of products made by a company known as the Ancient Dragon Culinary Corporation. Records of this company have been found, but as of writing, 
The location of the primary business office and other facilities used to make SCP-563-B are currently unknown. SCP-563-B products are sold in several East Asian countries, but have been discovered in some supermarket chains in the USA. Various instances of SCP-563-B include a pot of sours, an instant ramen made with sweet and sour sauce, and the meat of an unknown sauropod, presumably a smaller, easier to contain dinosaur, similar to Abrosaurus dongpoi. Notably, chunks of gastroliths have been found in this product, suggesting it is partially made with stomach meat. Ancient Dragon Velociraptor Noodles Instant noodles made with an assortment of meat from several dinosaurs, as well as pork, rice, and chunks of melon in what is advertised to be a Velociraptor broth. Testing of broth is inconclusive. Product reportedly tastes like high-quality instant noodles, with a high salt content. The first product of the Ancient Dragon Culinary Corporation to be sold in the USA in the specialty supermarket chain. Dragon Bone Tea Powdered tea advertised as being made using the bone meal of various species of dragon. DNA testing has shown that the particles are partially derived from non-fossilized dinosaur bone, but approximately 75% of the test results have been inconclusive. To date, this is the only product made by the Ancient Dragon Culinary Corporation that has been recalled for safety reasons. Dino Snacks Sold in Japan under varying flavors. Marketed using anthropomorphic dinosaur mascots, including Takara Tyrannosaurusu and Riza Raptoru. Product resembles American pork rinds. Testing of the product has revealed that it is made of several species. Kentucky Fried Therizinosaur, a deep fried poultry product sold as a frozen dinner in some parts of South Korea. As the name suggests, the meat is mostly made up of Therizinosaurus coloniformis. Reportedly, Tastes like a very tough chicken. Kyoryu Kogan, literally dinosaur testicles, sold primarily in Japan, consistently found to be made out of meat of pterosaurs of the Jehalopteris genus, advertised to increase sexual stamina and fertility in both men and women. Other non anomalous products in this line include ginkgo soup and candied fern leaves. Records found pertaining to the Ancient Dragon Culinary Corporation list SCP-563 as Production Farm 22. Investigations into the existence of the other 21-plus farms and other facilities related to SCP-563 is currently ongoing. Log 563-5 A partial log of deceased specimens of SCP-563-A A group of Microraptor Zawinus found in a locked shed near the central office of the farm. Injuries indicate that they were shot at close range with 10mm rounds. Notably, two instances were found to still be alive, having avoided fatal injuries from the gunshots and surviving on the carcasses of the deceased instances. All instances were found to have been wearing pet collars. Several hundred instances of Jeholopterus ninchengensis, presumably in an artificial nest, found in a large metal shed. Cause of death not immediately obvious. Testing showed that all instances had been exposed to cyanide gas. The carcasses of several species of unidentified sauropod, immolated, found in a field surrounded by a highly powerful 15-meter tall electric fence. Fence was found active upon containment of SCP-563, and contact with it resulted in severe injuries to a Recovery Force member. Burnt remains of several Keratopsian dinosaurs, including Protoceratops, were found near the aforementioned sauropod enclosure. Posthumous examination of all SCP-563-A instances found that up to 79% of the individuals found had a prion in their systems prior to their death. Testing on this prion found it to be similar to a prion that causes Kuru, suggesting that SCP-563-A instances had been fed or were feeding on the meat of the same species. Notably, most species of raptor found on site were immune to this prion. Addendum 
Document 563 ADCC 5. The following is a translation of a document recovered from behind a picture frame in the main office building at SCP-563. The document was partially damaged by mold. However, Foundation linguists have been able to reconstruct what they believe is an accurate rendition of the document. Dear Name Unknown, As the Americans say, we have hit the jackpot. Windfall. Big time. No more simple frozen meals for this failing company. The jungle you pointed us to has given us quite a boon. The meat is delicious. The fruit is unknown. Most likely a synonym of delicious. And the seafood. One of the cooks made stir-fry with ginger and... I suppose you would call them shrimp and clams. But honestly, I'm no paleontologist. It was the best thing I had ever tasted. And the eggs. Well, we're having difficulty finding unfertilized ones. The ones we do find either hatch or have babies, possibly embryos or zygotes, in them. But the things that do hatch, it would make an American scientist, most likely paleontologist, blush and then die of joy. We're sending back a few specimens to the leader. Next stop, unknown. Next sentence indicates a country to the north, most likely either Russia or Mongolia. Northward we go. With regards, Zo Song. Item number, SCP-565. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-565 is kept in a Type 3 aquatic object containment tank on level 4B of Site 77. It is fed twice daily and tested weekly for development or degradation of mental capacity. Staff who are so inclined may view SCP-565 during its scheduled feeding times by appointment with Dr. Schaefer. Description SCP-565 is an ambulatory human head, apparently male, which appears to mimic the behavioral patterns of Carpilius convexus, a species of coral crab. Its chief method of ambulation is the manipulation of tendrils of unfurled brain matter, which emanate from a large crush wound at the back of its skull. These tendrils are often utilized as legs, allowing SCP-565 to scuttle along the sea floor like a crab, but occasionally are operated for motion and manipulation in a manner similar to the tentacles of an octopus or jellyfish. To date, Foundation research has proven inconclusive on how and why SCP-565 remains animate, or how it is able to manipulate neural tissue in a manner suggestive of musculature. Testing is ongoing, but data expunged. Researchers who wish to contribute work or theory to the investigation of SCP-565 should contact Dr. Schaefer through the usual channels for an appointment and transfer interview. SCP-565 was caught by a fishing trawler called Saturday's Child off the coast of interviewed Captain and was informed that SCP-565 had been sighted several times by local fishermen and was apparently living as part of a crab colony in the area's reefs. Video footage taken by one such fisherman shows SCP-565 feeding on a dead clownfish. SCP-565 is not immune to the harmful effects of exposure to a watery environment and has continued to decay as is normal for dead tissue. It is estimated that SCP-565's decay will have advanced sufficiently to neutralize it within Addendum 565-1 Forensics testing has linked SCP-565 conclusively to the DNA and dental records of Edward Beltram deceased 1228 approximately two years before the first known sighting of SCP-565. Beltram was murdered by his wife Rebecca by strychnine poisoning and blunt force trauma to the back of the head, with description of the murder wound matching the wound through which the exposed cranial matter of SCP-565 protrudes. Dr. Schaefer has proposed that Beltram's body be exhumed for analysis. Addendum 565-2 Edward Beltram was exhumed by Foundation researchers on date expunged. The corpse had been beheaded, 
with wounds suggesting the head had been torn from the shoulders with extreme force rather than cut. Photographs taken by bereaved family members at Beltram's funeral show that the corpse's head was still attached at the time of burial, and the gravesite showed no evidence of having been disturbed. Beltram's corpse was retained for study, and his grave restored, with a substitute, as per standard Foundation empty casket protocols. Addendum 565-3 Data expunged. Task Force Psi-8 stationed on site reported no activity. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.